Supporting human conditions, not free market propaganda and corrupt politicians, cause they own by special interest groups that fund their campaign. Welcome to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Eleanor Goldfield. Today on the program in the first segment, we're delighted to welcome back to the show Professor Raza Rumi. He's director of the Park Center for Independent Media. We'll talk about the recent Izzy Awards, the 16th annual, where the Park Center for Independent Media honors the best in independent reporting. Raza Rumi and I will talk about the state of the so-called free press, what's happening in Gaza, and much more. Later in the program, my co-host Eleanor Goldfield and I talk about New York Times propaganda, spin and bias in the Western press as it relates to the ongoing attacks in Gaza. A new episode of the Project Censored Show coming up. Stay tuned. Unthinkable crimes perpetrated by criminal minds with political ties, habitualized alibis, disguised and other guys, democracy, politics, and the apocalypse. Got the skies like an ominous. Welcome to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. Today, in this segment of the program, we are honored to welcome back to the program Raza Rumi, a policy analyst, journalist, and author. He is distinguished lecturer at Roosevelt. House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, New York. He is the director of the Park Center for Independent Media and teaches in the journalism department. He is also faculty at Brooks School of Public Policy at Cornell University. During the 2015 through 2017 years, Raza was a scholar in residence at Ithaca College and taught courses in journalism and writing departments, as well as the Gallatin School of Individualized Study, New York University, Raza has been a fellow at the New America Foundation, United States Institute of Peace, and a member of the think tank at Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics at Georgetown University. Raza Rumi, welcome back to the Project Censored Show. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure, always. Uh, it's always wonderful to catch up with you. And again, we at Project Censored, of course, are acutely aware of the very fine work you do at the Park Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College. One of the many reasons we know about you, your work, and of course, the Park Center at Ithaca, founded by the great Jeff Cohen from Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting. You're the second director there over the years. You do something every year that I think is very interesting to our audience, and it is the Izzy Awards, named after the late, great, independent, muckraking journalist, I.F. Stone. And Project Censored's been around long enough since 1976 that we actually have a blurb from IF Stone supporting the work of Project Censored back in the day. So we, of course, are big fans of the things you're doing. Raza, could you tell our audience just briefly, what exactly is the Izzy Awards? This is the 16th year that you've all been doing those awards, and you recently announced this year's winners. There's going to be a ceremony at the end of April. And of course, this program is pre-recorded, but we'll be airing this show right around May 3rd, which is International Press Freedom Day. So you and I have a lot to talk about in this Izzy. segment. So Raza Rumi, the Izzies. Yes, thank you so much. You know, the Izzy Award started, as you mentioned, in uh, 2008. That is when the Park Center for Independent Media was set up at Ithaca College, one of its kind, perhaps the only such media in an academic space across the nation, which directly and exclusively focuses on non-corporate, independent, non-profit media and media streams. You know, that, of course, includes publications, includes documentary and other forms of communications, uh, but largely in the non-corporate zone. Because as you know, like the world media, the American media system is corporate controlled. A few handful of corporations own what 90% of media millions consume here and overseas. So the idea is to honor and 
recognize the important work that independent journalists do despite so many hurdles, financial difficulties, small budgets, etc. So each year we have been award, you, you know, giving this award to those who have made an impact. And, uh, you know, it includes really remarkable names like Amy Goodman, for example, of, of Democracy Now!, you know, it includes many journalists from, from The Intercept, from Mother Jones, from The Nation, from Inside Climate News, you know, groundbreaking stuff, which people don't find on uh, Washington Post or New York Times or CNN. And so how do we get it out? The award is also a way to promote this kind of media. So that's in brief what the purpose is. But, you know, because it is set up in a college in an academic space. So the idea is also to demonstrate to students in the communication school, in journalism department, this is also a possible career choice. You don't have to join Fox News the moment you graduate or your local corporate channel sort of peddling the interests of a few over the many, but you know, you can choose a path. I think that's what uh, what we have successfully done over the years at the Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College. This year's winners you recently announced, and again, at Project Sensor, there's such overlap with the missions and, and the interests that you all have at the Park Center. We honor independent media every year with our top underreported stories, meaning that these people do amazing work. These organizations do fantastic work. And like you just said, it's often under adverse situations. I mean, these are often underfunded. I mean, these are really labor of love kind of organizations, nonprofits. I mean, that's not to say that there's no money or no career path there, but it's not the easy way to do things, Raz Harumi. And I particularly am struck by the educational components. Again, at Project Censored, we're strong promoters of critical media literacy education. And the fact that this is housed at a college where you are teaching students about the importance of independent journalism. I mean, this is a stellar and fantastic thing. And this year, of course, the winners are no strangers to us here at Project Censored, the good folks over at In These Times out of Chicago. Amazing labor reporting. I know you have a special mention this year, recognition for the coverage of Democracy Now! This is, again, the kind of work that you're, you're putting up as journalism in the public interest, right? I know you accept nominations and so forth, but could you talk yeah. a little bit more about why these groups and these individuals are doing such important work? I mean, could you tell us a little bit about some of this year's winners? Yeah, certainly, certainly. Thank you. Uh, you know, as you also mentioned, you know, this is a labor of love. A lot of these journalists and small outlets, you know, are struggling all the time. But, you know, they're keeping the flame going. And that is what we are really interested in, because often what we see is that some of these stories have a huge impact. You know, ProPublica, for example, you know, has become a leading, leading voice. I mean, it is now cited before Congress testimonies and Senate hearings. It's not even a published uh, pub, uh, magazine, you know, it's a website. But look at its impact. And that is something that we really look for every year when we get like, you know, countless dozens and dozens of nominations. And then we have a panel of judges and me who go through and plow through lots of material. We don't generally do books, though we also get many good submissions on books. Primarily because what we want to do is look at some of the articles and podcasts and documentaries which may have a more public sort of appeal and, and engagement. So this year, in these times, as you noted, we recognize the outlet because they have done some stellar reporting during 2023. And the focus was on the lives, livelihoods, struggles, and voices of working class people from the meatpacking laborers in Iowa to coal miners in Appalachia, poor women in Mississippi, and the employees of high-end resorts in Montana and Colorado who can't afford housing anywhere near their jobs. And 
You know, these are the stories you don't hear, the, hear on media. CNN or New York Times hardly talk about these issues. So who is going to talk about people and working people, especially in America, where we know that, you know, high inflation and, and uh, rising inequality and, you know, declining incomes has put the working people in a real, real tight spot. And the, you know, purpose of independent journalism has to be give voice to these voiceless groups. And they are large groups in, uh, in rural and, and semi-urban areas of America. You know, that's the other problem with the media bias here. Uh, you know, and, and Mickey, you, it's, it's well known. I'm just repeating that, you know, it is so much uh, focused on big cities and especially on the East Coast and the West Coast. And there's a clear bias, you know, that's the universe. Exactly. So New York is the universe. I mean, that's an entire America. What about the middle America, Southern America, you know, all these, all these other places where people are struggling. So that's why in these times was recognized. We also gave this award to remarkable reporters in Chicago, one from Invisible Institute and the other from the Sahili Bureau, who've done this uh, seven-part investigative series called Missing in Chicago. Basically, where they've exposed the mismanagement, mishandling of Chicago's police on of missing person cases. And surprise, surprise, most of these affect black women and girls. So, yes. you know, these reporters plowed through so much material. You know, there were 30,000 complaints filed, which identified buried patterns of misconduct and marginalized homelessness, substance abuse mental disorders, and they looked at how basically the police was completely mismanaging these. And certainly, you know, this had a lot of impact within the Chicago area and within the communities. And so we thought that this was something that ought to be given its due recognition. And then two of the nation has founded uh, in Palestine, Muhammad al-Kurd, who's basically written these uh, lyrical and powerful essays in the nation, basically about the Palestinians' uh, people's right to speak for themselves and how Western media rarely amplifies their voices and actually attributes things to them, puts words in their mouth and, and doesn't really talk about, you know. So it's a larger pattern of dehumanization of the Palestinian people. And that is why democracy now also gets a special mention because they have consistently since October 2023 reported on what was happening in Gaza, in particular, you know, the, the kind of blockades and the civilian uh, targets, you know, Geneva Conventions, international hum humanitarian law, international law of the armed conflict prohibits uh, targeting civilians and civilian installations like hospitals, schools. But we have seen everything has happened in broad daylight in front of our eyes. And for months and weeks, the mainstream corporate media, especially in the U.S., was denying it, was only putting across the official version by the Israeli military or the government. And democracy now, as you know, as always, they're brave to put out the version of people who live in that region. You can learn more at parkindymedia.org, and the list is there. Mohammed El Kurd from The Nation, whom you were just speaking about, is the first Palestine correspondent in the nation's 160-year history as an independent magazine. It's very significant to point that out as well. And you link to the pieces here, the pieces that you were just speaking about. And Raza Rumi, that obviously opens up the topic of Gaza and media coverage of Gaza, and that's certainly something that you and I are going to talk about. I wanted to, however, briefly just pause to remind our listeners that you're tuned to the Project Censored show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff, and we are speaking to the director of the Park Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College. We are speaking with Professor Raza Rumi. We will be back and continue our conversation after this brief musical break. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Project Center Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. In this segment today, we are honored to welcome back to the program, Raza Rumi. Raza is the second director at the Park Center for Independent Media, distinguished lecturer at Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. He's an author. He has done many, many things, and you can check out his work. Of course, you can learn more at the Park Center site. It's Park Indie Media dot o-r-g also teaching again as i mentioned at hunter college in new york now also has taught at cornell and many other places raza rumi you were just telling us about the very important izzy awards that really call attention to the important voices in independent media we were talking about some of the winners that were just announced and is going to be celebrated at the end of april gaza the issue and you and i have talked in between about some of the just absolute atrocious media coverage that's gone on in the West, in the United States in particular. Let's talk about that. You, know, you mentioned it before the break, just the absolutely shameful and disgusting kind of coverage that we've been seeing. But I also want to talk to you about and hear your views about how you maybe see some of that coverage changing in the West. I mean, it's painful to watch places like the New York Times try to do mental gymnastics and bend over backwards to just not state the obvious. But let's talk a little bit about this. You well know, as you just talked about the amazing work that independent journalists are doing, especially Mohammed El Kurd. We can certainly talk about others, whether it's Electronic Intifada, Mint Press News, Rania Kalik. There's a lot of people that are covering what's going on in Gaza. But as you pointed out, they're not at the New York Times. They're not at the BBC. They're not on CNN, these places. So what's your assessment of the, the Western media coverage? And have you seen a shift at all? You know, certainly, I think that is something that merits. Uh, I mean, we can go on and on for hours. But I think the the problem here is that we know that the Western media and corporate media in particular, is very much uh, a veritable arm of the military-industrial complex. Now, deliberately, wittingly, unwittingly, I mean, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist. Maybe it just so happens that rich people have common interests and common friends in D.C. or wherever. It could very well be that, right? Just to give them a little benefit of the doubt. So I guess we can see that October 7th was Definitely a terrible, terrible day in our recent history. You know, what Hamas did to Israeli civilians can certainly not be condoned by any means. I mean, I know there are many arguments and theories about that, and I'm not going to go into that because I think attacking and hurting civilians or taking them as hostages, it doesn't solve anything. It only aggravates the issue. Having said that, the disproportionate response by Israeli government and the military on an already occupied and subjugated and ill-treated people is what makes it worse. And the media, instead of looking at the larger picture, the history of why Palestinians are there, why does Hamas exist in the first place? Why is Hamas getting that kind of support, not by all Palestinians, but a sizable number of why do people support them? And I think it, it hasn't really gone into those questions. It never has because it wants to highlight and regurgitate the strong security re relationship that the Israeli government and the American government have. And that is what has been narrated through and through months, you know, in, in the corporate media. So much so that when hospitals were attacked, justifications were made as to there are underground terror cells or schools were being attacked. Aid workers, journalists, who kills aid workers, humanitarian workers? I know human beings have a terrible history and I know there's been lots of barbarity, but we are in the 21st century. If we haven't learned from our history and from what has happened in the, in the past centuries, then obviously we have not learned enough. And that is where, so first of all, I think it has to do with the dehumanization of Palestinian people and civilians. Because that is something that is, if we are concerned about Israeli civilians, then Palestinian lives have an equal value and an equal measure of reporting and coverage to inform the publics, both in the United States and abroad. But, you know, in the U.S., it's even more important because billions of dollars from the U.S. taxpayers go to Israel. Now, 
who is the government supporting? And that is what a lot of activists and young people say in America, that, you know, it is our tax dollars. And certainly we have a right to check and ask the government. So with this one-sided biased reporting, the parallel was social media, venues like TikTok, venues like Instagram that were presenting an alternative picture of what was going on and actually citing voices from Palestine. So Palestinian content makers, you know, ordinary people, their vloggers, their young people on TikTok, I mean, until their internet was shut down or later on they moved to a secure place, they were reporting in a far better way. And that led to this outrage, this historic movement on campuses in almost every city of America. And now the polls show that majority of Americans oppose this war in Gaza and not due to the corporate media. Oh, this to citizen journalism, which is remarkable. And I know I'm not doing a blanket sort of eulogy of social media because there are problems, lack of fact-checking, misinformation, propaganda. Yes, it's there. And Israelis have also been doing that. You know, we saw Israeli TikTokers making fun of Palestinian people in siege, you know, that they don't have water. Or how would they cook food? Oh, they're starving. You know, they were actually making yeah. fun of that. And, you know, that really hurts you because obviously I can't blame them. They are victims of propaganda within Israel as well about the Palestinian people and about the whole conflict. Because often young people, just like in America, a large number of people are kept ignorant or, or misinformed or, or subjected to propaganda uh, for the imperatives of a national security state. And I think that is what is happening in Israel as well. Because, you know, you have to create a very obedient, a very pliant public and media is the tool. Media is the tool. Media, cinema, mainstream mm -hmm. corporate, mm -hmm. you know, communications are the tool to keep masses in the dark. Last month, we had an opportunity to do a great event with Roger Stahl, Robin Anderson, Fatou Massad, and Manar Adlai on Roger's great film, Theaters of War that talks about how the CIA and the Pentagon have long controlled these narratives through entertainment, quote unquote, right? <laughs> Infotainment, literally script writing, censoring the whole nine yards, hundreds and then thousands of shows and so forth. So it's not just the corporate media, it's all this information ecosystem. And I find it very interesting, Raza, that around the same time we see this decline in trust in the legacy press in, in the US and we see these statistics, as you said, going from full-scale support for what was happening with Israel to now a majority of Americans have said, no, this is not something that we approve of. This is not something that we support. This is not who we are. At the same time, we see the Biden administration trying to get rid of TikTok or ban TikTok, foreign propaganda. But don't yeah. worry about Meta or Google or Alphabet or Facebook or Fang or the rest of the big tech companies. It's just TikTok. Raza Rumi, your thoughts on that? That was remarkable, you know, in a country which is, of course, world's oldest uh, democracy, you know, at least in this part of the world. But, you know, to muzzle a social media platform used by so many millions and especially young people was remarkable. Yeah. It was, of course, couched in this national security excuses that, you know, the Chinese are planting and spying on people or blah, blah, blah. And yes, I mean, if they are, I mean, you know, the U.S. has the best uh, techies in the world who, who can check this as to what kind of data, etc. And, and you can put on those filters. But, you know, the outright idea to censor and muzzle this platform was very much related to what was happening on Gaza. And, you know, I'll tell you, Mickey, what really upsets me, you know, you talked about cinema. So I remember, you know, once I used to teach a course at Ithaca College and, you know, we looked at films and, you know, I don't know if you remember this Hollywood blockbuster, American Sniper. Oh, yes. That talks about this, the, the PTSD of a soldier, of a veteran from Iraq and casually brushes aside all the people that he shot. And all the tragedy that fell upon Iraqi people, they were, I mean, they were remarkable for the lack of presence in that film. And that film was about Iraq war, I mean, about, about conflict and the, and the toll that it takes. And similarly, you know, 
a lot of these cinematic productions, you know, over time have inculcated this necessity of war. Now, look at the treatment of the Ukrainian people as mm -hmm. opposed to the yeah. Palestinians. You know, so I don't, I don't want to go in deeper into that, but you know, because Ukraine has been targeted by Russia, which uh, in the Cold War mindset, which persists in America, refuses to go away, Russia is still the enemy. Russia is nothing compared to the US. It is a country with an economy almost the size of Spain, far inferior to the US. The Russian military is not a superior military machine to the US. The US military spending and the machine is far larger. But Russia is created as such a huge threat. And yes, I'm not denying that Russians would be up to no good. They would do that. And we know Putin is a dictator. But these threats are amplified because you have to create you know, for the imperatives of a national security state. And similarly, uh, for the continued military assistance to Israel and all the money that is given out by both Democrats and Republicans, there's a bipartisan consensus when it comes to the killing of Palestinian people. Yeah. So obviously, the reaction by the Biden administration and the Congress has been, how do we fix this problem? My young kids are being misled by all these TikTok yeah. videos. Oh my God, what a threat to national security. But, you know, I also would like to add that I think what has also happened is that the Democrats have been badly exposed. I mean, mm -hmm. we knew that already. I mean, we knew from Obama years, from earlier. But in this particular conflict, you know, President Biden's conduct, his vacillation, his refusal to smell the coffee, his refusal to acknowledge the public opinion has been a major blow. I mean, for them, Biden will suffer in this election. The primaries, people uncommitted voting over 20% in places like Minnesota, D.C. just did it. I mean, it's a trend and they're pretending it's not connected, but it's directly connected to the Gaza policy. Oh, absolutely. And so they're uncommitted, but it is also terrible for the United States role. I mean, it calls itself as the sort of global leader in democracy and someone invested in the idea of exporting democracy and democratic values and American values and human rights, etc. All of that has been exposed. I mean, in the academia, which is the so-called bastion of free speech, intellectual freedom, we have seen how professors have been targeted. They've been suspended. Students in Ivy League Columbia's university were suspended. Three of them, can you imagine, for holding a particular brand, set of views? Yeah. Oh, my God. And students are being attacked all over. It just happened and, in, in Sleepy Claremont at Pomona College. They just called in what looked like a military occupation. That has been deeply disappointing for me, Mickey, because, you know, I moved into academia nearly a decade ago because I thought, you know, I'm in the U.S., this is the great intellectual space. I would have all the freedom in the world. But, you know, I've realized, no, that was a mirage because there's freedom on everything except Palestine or perhaps yeah. except the military industrial complex to, yeah. to have it exposed directly. But, you know, this has been really, really sobering. You know, the political elites, the corporate media elites and the corporate higher education yeah. elites they all seem to be invested into this violent project in the Middle East. And the people, I mean, hats off to young people of America who are really challenging that and resisting that. And hats off to organizations like Jewish Voices for Peace and other groups who said not in our name. Don't do this killing. Don't violate all laws, international laws in our name. So I think what has happened is that the corporate media in the last uh, six or seven months has further fallen from grace. It already had been losing its credibility, but I think after this experience, they will find themselves in a, in a greater crisis. We're even seeing that at NPR, you know, where a voice of conscience comes out and says, look, we haven't been covering issues well, and the public has caught on. And the public yeah. realizes that, that we're not really reporting in the interest yeah. of people. That's really part of the crisis of journalism. And we're back to independent media, the independent muckraking press, which really it's leading. It's where the, the so-called industry part of the problem there. But that's really where journalism is thriving. And that's where these stories matter so much. We've seen the New York Times literally producing fake news, 
bogus stories and repeating them over and over and over, whether it's beheadings or rapes or other things. It's WMD level deception and chicanery going back over 20 years at the Times. And in Israel, we see similar issues. They're banning news outlets. Oh, yeah. But you know about the role of indie press? I mean, I was startled. I didn't really know Puerto Rico, for example, has only one pediatric heart surgeon. I thought it was part of America. I mean, one for the entire region. And of course, the nation uh, reported on it. I didn't read it in the Washington Post because (laughs) they don't care. So a lot of important stories. And, you know, that is why we need the independent media a bigger and more financially stronger uh, independent media in this country. Raza Rumi, there's obviously a connection here too. I know you do a lot around human rights. And of course, we're actually talking about critical media literacy, the knowing of why wouldn't the Washington Post write about some of these stories or what does compel them to do the things they do write about or publish. And again, that's the media literacy, the critical media literacy angle, looking at the owners, the advertisers, looking at all the other forces. You mentioned the commercial forces just moments ago. Those are very, very real. And when I was saying that we're talking about a, quote, news industry, and I quip that that's part of the problem, is that it is the privately owned for-profit model that's really failed the public interest at large, failed the public repeatedly, and it's failing Gazans. It's failing Palestinians. It's failing on some of the most fundamental and important issues of our time around war and peace, life and death. And these are no laughing matters And we have all these resources and things at our disposal, and it is further disgusting to see it used to promote more violence, to promote disinformation, and to actually encourage censorship and try to silence the voices of others. Raza Rumi, the work you do at the Park Center is so important. I just wanted to give you the last words to talk about any of the other things that you'd like to bring up or also remind people where they can find you or where they can follow the important work that you do. Oh, uh, thank you so much. So, you know, as you already mentioned, parkindymedia.org is our website of the Park Center for Independent Media. You can find out about our events, all uh, the, the Izzy Award and other things that we do on, on that site. My personal website is razarumi.com, R-A-Z-A-R-U-M-I.com, where my writings are archived. I try and keep up. Sometimes uh, it takes a bit of effort to update that. But as you mentioned, Mickey, I moved to New York City now last fall, and I'm now teaching at the Public Policy and Human Rights Program at Hunter College. And certainly this is a transition, but, you know, I would now be engaged come this fall with independent media. I'll, of course, stay engaged in a different form. I'll probably write more and less of administration. Yeah. But I do want to highlight, you know, we talked about the problems of independent media. So I think many academics, they have been proposing an alternative model to the for-profit media. Because even the for-profit media is in decline Mm -hmm. and is seriously endangered. We saw what happened with BuzzFeed. We saw uh, the layoffs at Washington Post, LA Times. Read that all the time. And what is now required is a fundamental media reform. We also need a larger public media because the United States, among the advanced countries of the world, advanced in in terms of income and wealth, is the country that spends the least Mm -hmm. on public media. Canada spends more than the US. The Scandinavian countries, Western European countries, even some of the developing countries spend more on public media. And that is perhaps what we need because we have this corporatization, but we also have the drying out of local journalism where counties are turning into news deserts with no local publication. And that also helps these big tech companies spread misinformation or doctored truths through their platforms like Meta. (laughs) So it doesn't really bode well for democracy in in the U.S., And so that is why media literacy has to emerge as a kind of a central pillar of education at at the high schools. You know, I would say earlier, but perhaps high school, you have to start from that level and then should be a mandatory component of journalism curricula, of communications curricula, and perhaps all liberal arts curricula. And I think we need to make a 
concerted effort and bring in the curricular designers and all the other but you know that's the other problem that you know dealing with sometimes with the academics is also a tough call because you know they think they already know everything and they know more than you but what they need to realize is that what is happening we as practitioners of media know what is happening because we on a daily basis deal with readers we look at their comments we engage with them we engage with writers and editors and reporters and citizen journalists and so we see this gaping hole this huge need for media literacy better education and i think that should be our future agenda I could not agree more Raza Rumi of course at project censored we've done the media and me one of the very few if only critical media literacy books for young people written for young people there's only five states in the US that are mandating media literacy education at this juncture which is paltry California just came online but they just don't have the plans and the curricula is not all even and all equal you know NATO has gotten into the media literacy game corporations are all into the media literacy game but that's not critical media literacy it's more advocacy for the same kind of top down managed news propaganda that permeates that landscape so raza rumi as ever it's always fantastic to talk to you and catch up and i am very happy that you talked about the need for a strong public media the hedge fund newspapers and the news deserts that we see are certainly not good for us and here we are in another election year it's like a really bad rerun of a tragic comedy or something the same two older candidates a majority of people don't like either of the major corporate party candidates the third parties have been derailed because of the way the system operates so i really think that media literacy education critical media literacy education is really a serious core of the solution you called it a pillar and yeah. i i can't think of a better term for it raza so again as ever your wit your wisdom and your brilliant observations are always welcome here at the project centered show can't thank you enough for the important work that you do raza rumi is a policy analyst journalist and author distinguished lecturer at roosevelt house public policy institute hunter college also the director of the park center for independent media raza rumi as ever thanks for joining us on the project centered show today thank you ricky that was my conversation with raza rumi up next on the project centered show i talked to Co-host Eleanor Goldfield will talk about the state of the free press and we'll talk about current efforts of censorship afoot from the corporate media to academia and beyond. Stay with us. Thanks everyone for joining us back at the Project Censored radio show. I'm very glad to be joined by my co-host, Mickey Huff, to talk about, once again, the state of our free so-called press. So Mickey, today I wanted to just jump into this story that has been shared. It was posted on April 15th by The Intercept. This story feels like it should be filed in one of those, oh, I felt this and I knew this kind of inherently, but oh, now I have it on black and white. I've got the receipt. And this story is basically that the New York Times instructed, it was a memo by the uh, Times Standard editor, Susan Wessling, and international editor, editor Philip Pan and their deputies, which instructed journalists to not use the terms genocide, ethnic cleansing, and to avoid the phrase occupied territory. The memo also instructs reporters to not use the word Palestine, except in very rare cases, and to steer clear of the term refugee camps to describe areas of Gaza historically settled by displaced Palestinians. So, wow, Mickey, again, this feels like something that we already felt inherently, <laughs> but it's really amazing to have the receipt. 
where it basically is telling all of the people who work at the New York Times to avoid the words to describe the reality of what's happening right now in Palestine. Eleanor, it's always good to catch up with you and talk about the state of our so-called free press. And here's a perfect example, riffing on the old A.J. Liebling axiom, the best way to ensure having freedom of the press is to own one. So we see that the folks over at the New York Times and the owners of the press there have decided to curate reality by just disappearing words and concepts from the language. It doesn't get more mm. Orwellian than that. One of the points that one of the Times newsroom folks said they wanted to be anonymous, they were fearful of reprisal. And in these days, I guess fear is quite, quite the power currency. And censorship is a good way to continue to impose that kind of fear and create a chilling effect across mm -hmm. the board. And this quote from this person, I think is pretty telling. It says, quote, I think it's the kind of thing that looks professional and logical if you have no knowledge of the historical context of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But if you do know it, it'll be clear mm -hmm. how apologetic it is to Israel. That person was talking about the censorship of those terms that you just brought up, that again, from an outsider perspective or people hearing this are saying, well, they're just trying to be fair and balanced. They've got to hear from both sides. But this is a classic example of the both sidesing of something when it's completely, absolutely lopsided in reality. And that's why a lot of folks have turned off from the establishment press or legacy press or prestige press, as some call it. But the New York Times, I mean, remember, this is the Judy Miller paper that propounded with great sobriety the WMD fiasco, you know, that decimated Iraq and led to the killing of over a million people there. So mm -hmm. that the so-called paper of record has been caught with its pants down, openly calling for this kind of censorship, only to spin in damage control to make it seem like they're being fair, is patently absurd. And in fact, last year in November, to further this issue, there was a study done at the Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights, and it was titled Presumptively Anti-Semitic Islamophobic Tropes in the Palestine-Israel Discourse. And the study goes on to show how there is wild bias toward Israel in U.S. academics, in our public institutions, and of course, in the media. And it actually prescriptively calls for three steps that can work to change this, to try to get the public aware of the fact that there is an entirely other side to this narrative from the Palestinian perspective that the paper of record wants to whitewash and entirely leave out, to not even discuss or debate the issues of genocide. And it's preposterous that people could still take places like the New York Times seriously. The BBC has been caught doing this. Of course, we know MSNBC let go of Arab and Palestinian journalists. I mean, this is completely disgraceful, and it's happening in the open, Eleanor. And this is why people of all stripes need to decry it. This is a problem for everyone when the press errs and falters in this extraordinary way. And I think it's also very important to recognize that propaganda relies on censorship. So you can't have propaganda unless you're censoring some kind of perspective or some kind of angle that deserves and needs to be heard. But you can't have the propaganda without it. So you can't create this idea of Israel as a victim or even just the very base idea of Israel's right to exist. You cannot create that propagandized notion without censoring the lived experiences and realities of Palestinians since actually way before 1948. 1948 is just when Israel became an official state, thanks to the UK's mandate. So the New York Times, as a propaganda rag, needs to have that censorship. And the thing is that most of that censorship happens either through self-censorship. The people working at the New York Times are people who believe in, you know, American exceptionalism and these things. But sometimes, and I think it's also very telling that there was this memo, it says to me that it's falling apart, that internally, even in these halls of the mighty, quote unquote, these ideas are falling apart. Just like we saw Abby Martin, for instance, was recently on Pierce Morgan. Why would he have Abby Martin on at all? It's because this narrative in and of itself is starting to crumble. And even the people who should be and have upheld it for so long can't find a way to keep this lie going. And the headlines, the stories are getting more and more absurd. Our good friend of Project Censored, Alan McLeod, just yep. yesterday, we're recording this on April 18th, just yesterday he shared 
And it should be an Onion headline, but it's an op-ed by the great uh, Thomas Friedman over oh, at the New York Times. Yes. And it says, how to be pro-Palestinian, pro-Israeli, and pro-Iranian. And I'm not kidding. That's the headline. It's just getting so dumb. It's getting so <laughs> absurd. And so they're like really just struggling to come up with anything to keep this farce alive. And so the fact that that memo even needed to be shared proves that that propaganda is crumbling. You mentioned Abby Martin. You mentioned our colleagues over at the Mint Press, Menar, a Palestinian American journalist who experiences censorship fairly regularly. For those folks that pretend that this started October 7th of last year, don't forget we covered when Abby Martin was censored by a media literacy conference of all things several years ago in Georgia, one of the places where they had the anti BDS laws. So if you spoke in favor of boycott divestment sanctions around Israel, Palestine, you were verboten from being paid to speak at universities, et cetera. They basically censored her at an academic conference and weren't going to pay her because of her work on Gaza. And of course, her film Gaza Fights for Freedom. I mean, this was years ago. We've been covering the censorship of this issue going decades back at Project Censored. So again, this didn't just start on October 7th. That's that part of that censorship frame that you just brought up, Eleanor, that the propaganda can't work without censorship. It's two sides of that coin. And you're right. The facade is definitely cracking. And in higher education, where we're supposed to be protecting free speech and protecting things like academic freedom, we just saw one of our vaunted universities over the University of Southern California preemptively cancel their own valedictorian's commencement speech before they had any idea what she was going to do or say. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's completely calculated, and they cited vague concerns about safety. They said, well, we're not sure. This is a volatile climate, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is sheer nonsense. It's the pandering to the fear card that is always behind the issue of censorship. And by the way, this young woman who was honored to be selected as a 2024 valedictorian, her name is Asna Tabasam at USC. She was a biomedical engineering major. Her words, if you want to read them over at counterpunch.org, they actually published the whole statement from her on April 16th. And I just wanted to read just a couple brief passage of it just to show what's going on here. And she says that she was honored to be selected, and although it should be a time of celebration for my family, friends, professors, and classmates, anti-Muslim and anti-Palestinian voices have subjected me to a campaign of racist hatred because of my uncompromising belief in human rights for all. And she goes on to say this, instead of allowing the campaign of hatred to define who she is and what she stands for, she takes this opportunity to tell us about herself. And in the Counterpunch published piece, she goes on to say how she's a first-generation South Asian American Muslim. She has a passion for service that stemmed from her experience her grandparents had because they couldn't access life-saving medical technology. Like, this is how this has influenced this younger person. She's dedicated her young life already to helping people less fortunate than her. She was working on building walkers and shipping medical gowns and things to Ukraine, writing about the Rwandan genocide. This is just absolutely amazing. And she says, by canceling my speech, USC is only caving to fear and rewarding hatred. My identities and experiences inspired me to think outside the box, a mindset I cultivated at USC. And it is this very quality that contributed to my selection as USC valedictorian. Here's the concluding passage. As the valedictorian, I implore my USC classmates to think outside the box, to work towards a world where cries for equality and human dignity are not manipulated to be expressions of hatred. I challenge us to respond to ideological discomfort with dialogue and learning, not bigotry and censorship. And I urge us to see mm -hmm. past our deepest fears and recognize the need to support justice for all people, including the Palestinian people. Those are the words of Asna Tabassum. USC class valedictorian of 2024, who was just preemptively censored from giving a valedictorian speech. Eleanor, this is going on across the country, going on across Europe, the censorship of people speaking out. It's happened even at my own college, where there is concern for safety. And there have actually been incidents of violence at my college against Palestinian students, against Muslim students. And yet the tropes of anti-Semitism and the fact that the quote, other side is playing victim and being persecuted, 
you know, that's a very dangerous claim, especially to cry wolf under such circumstances, because anti-Semitism is very real. And as you mm -hmm. know, Eleanor, there's a long history of Jewish hatred in the United States. So this isn't something to be played with lightly. And again, back to the issue of censorship, it's something we can't take lightly, and we need to stand up and speak up for uh, what's happening in Gaza and speak up for the Palestinian people. As a Jew, I take it very personally, and I get proper mad, as the Brits would say, <laughs> when people use anti-Semitism to describe the legitimate critique of Israel, because it does two things. One, as it, you pointed out, downplays actual anti-Semitism that I have myself experienced in my life and that, of course, my family experienced far more than I have. And the second thing is that it conflates Israel and Judaism. And that is the one thing that makes me angrier than anything else, because it is very important that we make that distinction. There are actually more Christian Zionists in the United States than there are Jews in the world. There are roughly 30 million Christian Zionists in the United States, roughly 60 million Jews worldwide. And the bulk of us are, in fact, diasporic Jews, as in we do not think or want or claim that the Palestinian land is our home, quote unquote. And also to try and uplift Jewish suffering either historically or try to claim that there's Jewish suffering now that compares to the genocide that's happening in Gaza is grotesque and unacceptable. And I also love the, the euphemistic language, right? Like, oh, it's a safety concern. Really? Okay, well, then the censorship of reporters is just guidelines, as somebody pointed out. Oh, it's style guidelines. No, that's like, how many metaphors should we use? That's, well, that's a style the, the guideline. The architecture of censorship, it's baked in, right? Right. And so, and, and of course, this is always, you know, the, 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 it's always okay for somebody else to do it. So for instance, like The Intercept did an analysis that showed that major newspapers like The New York Times used terms like slaughter, massacre, and horrific when talking about Israeli civilians that had been killed. But The New York Times actually put in their memo that you should not use words like slaughter or massacre uh -huh. or carnage. Well, then shouldn't that apply to both sides? But of course, it never does. And same thing with the censorship of the commencement speaker. Well, then shouldn't you also be censoring, if that's what you're going to be doing, shouldn't you also be worried about the safety concerns of any speakers that might be pro-Zionist? Because that should also be a <laughs> quote-unquote safety concern. But of course, it's never applied equally. And censorship can't be applied equally if you really want to have a propagandistic media landscape, mm. because you have to then uplift those stories that are a part of your propagandistic line. And in this case, those are pro-Israel stories. So all kinds of censorship is happening, whether that be in places like schools and universities, where if anywhere was going to be a place <laughs> of free debate and speech, it should be these places. And it's really frightening to see how those places seem to be, in a lot of ways, the vanguard of censorship. Mm. The SPJ Code of Ethics states that ethical journalism is truthful, compassionate, independent, and transparent. We need ethical journalism and journalists who work each day with the profession's highest standards in mind for democracy and society to thrive. And they hope that Ethics Week will not only help journalists in their endless pursuit of seeking truth and reporting it, but that the public will gain a better understanding of what is ethical journalism, why it's important, and the lengths journalists go to ensure the information they're providing is truthful, minimizes harm, is independent, accountable, and transparent. This is, again, very closely aligned with what we call academic freedom and the principles that we're supposed to uphold at colleges, universities, and schools. Education and journalism have very similar missions to educate the public, to inform people so that they can be more meaningfully civically engaged. This is why independent journalism is so important, and this is why we need to protect academic freedom, not just for the USC valedictorian, but for everybody, the students at the community colleges, the students everywhere across this country that are in fear for speaking out about the things that they see. And as we said earlier, Eleanor, and as you pointed out, the facade seems to be cracking. If the leaked memo at the New York Times is showing that they're actually having to bend over backwards to hide what's happening in Gaza, it's going to be a really bad moment here whenever there's a tipping point. Like, I'm trying to remember back when the New York Times finally figured out that the WMD claim they were peddling was false. I think it was a pretty fizzled moment. It wasn't a eureka moment. We also saw after the 2016 election, many of the legacy media outlets saying, gosh, we blew the election coverage. We really need to fix that. Mm -hmm. Only to go on and do worse in 2020 and continuing that bad job now. 
That's why we really need to stand up for independent journalism. We need to really promote ethics. It's SPJ Ethics Week in journalism. I think we can all learn a little bit by checking out what these ethics are and employing them in our walk and talk in our daily lives. Absolutely, Nikki. Uh, so well said, all of that. And as usual, we could spend the next few hours <laughs> just uh, just dissecting this issue. And so I'm glad that we got some time this week to just uplift that remarkable piece of evidence that's been shared in The Intercept. And yes. as always, don't read The New York Times. Uh, <laughs> at best, use it for toilet paper and um, go to alternative media sources on projectcensor.org. There are several of them listed. And uh, y'all can listen here, and we oftentimes share what our source, what we use as sources, and you know, keep digging. And yes, do check out that spj.org. Mickey, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me once again. Eleanor, it's always a pleasure when we can literally co-host together. Indeed. Until next time, everyone. You've been listening to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio, established in 2010 by myself and Peter Phillips. I'm Mickey Huff, the executive producer and host of the program. Anthony Fest is our longtime senior producer. The Project Censored Show airs on roughly 50 stations around the United States from Maui to New York. To learn more about our work or find any of our previous archive programs, go to projectcensored.org. Please follow and like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the official Project Censored show on your cell phone's podcast application. Please feel free to share your feedback about our work at projectcensored.org. Thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Unthinkable crimes perpetrated by the criminal minds with political ties, habitualized alibis, disguised another guise of democracy, politics, and the apocalypse. Got the skies looking ominous. So the ocean burned bright with waves full of poison. Genocide wars fall for little boys in the weapons manufacturing paid for by taxing while the bridges and the levees and the mines collapsing. All the prisons, those are capacity citizens. And the times for the master thief, combine and conquer, steal a masterpiece. Open your eyes and realize what's happening. Times running out the reach all potential fame at the table, then you're probably on the menu. We got that love. The Yerba Buena Gardens Festival celebrates its 24th year by kicking off its annual series of outdoor concerts starting on Saturday, May 4th from 1 to 3.30 p.m. Their opening concert features Cuban percussionist Pedrito Martinez. This event happens at the Yerba Buena Gardens on the Great Lawn, located on Mission Street between 3rd and 4th Streets in San Francisco. More than 100 programs and events are scheduled for this year's Yerba Buena Gardens Festival, spanning music and theater to dance and poetry. KPFA is a proud co-sponsor of this event. This free outdoors festival is all ages and is wheelchair accessible. For more information, call 415-543-1718 or go to www.ybgfestival.org. KPFA's paid staff are a union. Hosts, producers, engineers, reporters, anchors, technical employees, phone room coordinators, event producers, trabajadores de instalaciones. We're part of Communication Workers of America, local 9415, AFL-CIO, because unity makes strength and unions make great media. Together with KPFA's unpaid staff and volunteers and every one of you who donate, we make KPFA 94.1 FM in Berkeley, KPFB 89.3 FM in Berkeley, KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno, and 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and KPFA.org. Mm-hmm.